to Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. Lord, we thank you once again for your word. We pray for the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds. We want to open our hearts to what you say. Teach us, encourage us, convict us, lead us, guide us. Be glorified in us and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Leviticus 11.1, 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. So just as a reminder, the book of Leviticus, the major theme is holiness. God has revealed himself to the nation of Israel Um, He rescued them, he saved them, he invited them into a covenant relationship with him, and he reveals himself to them as holy. And so they were taught that in ways at the beginning of the book of Leviticus and uh, Exodus as it relates to the tabernacle, the sacrificial system, the priesthood. And God is also showing them uh, in this book... uh, that as a chosen and holy people, how they are to live in a manner that's holy. And some of that's already been shown uh, as they've been given the tabernacle to build. They were obedient to that. As they've been given the uh, priesthood to establish, they were obedient to get that going. They've been giving the sacrificial system. They've At this point, they've done that now. But it also expands into their their everyday behavior, their, the way they live their lives. Um, as a holy people, they were to be set apart from the world, set apart unto God. And, and that means that they, would t- they were to act differently than the world. And God would define specifically how they would do that in a lot of different areas of life. And we get the same thing in the New Testament One of the reasons why we study our Bibles all the time as believers is because God, just like he called them to be a holy people, he calls us to be holy, but we live in a world that is very much not set apart to God. And so just as God did with Israel in the Old Testament, he does with us in the New Testament, he gives us instruction how to live set apart to him. And we always have the option every day at all that's every time we have the option as to whether we're going to live different than the world and set apart to God or if we're just going to live just like the world and not be set apart to God but the only way we know the difference the only way we know is by his word there's no other way to know um, is uh, like the world or not like the world And is this the the set-apartness that God wants for his people or not? The only way we can know that is by what he's revealed to us in his word. And that's why we study it all the time. Now, for Israel, in the same way, they needed instruction about how to be set apart and how to live holy lives unto God because, for one, they had just come out of 400 years of living in Egypt. And when they lived there, they saw every manner of unholy living, every manner of godlessness and sinful living, things that God never intended for people to do. And having come out, so they came out of that, so that's, that's their frame of reference. And they're headed to a new land where they're going to enter in, where there's a bunch of people already living. And they're also, those people are already living in ways that God never intended in all kinds of wickedness too. And so where they came from and where they were headed both were very poor examples and they were never to be the standard of here's how you figure out how to live in a way that's pleasing to God. None of it was. Not where they came from, not where they're going. And, and so God would have to be the one. Don't get your standard from where you came from. 
don't get your standard to where you're going to. Get your standard for me. And so, and it's the same for us. When a person becomes a Christian, we're coming out of a sinful life. We're coming out of a sinful background. We're coming out of worldliness. We're coming out of all manner of things that God doesn't want us to do. And he calls us to be holy. But we don't really know what that means. And, and so, and, and if we try to figure out, out on our own, we'll misunderstand it like so many people do. A lot of times people think, well, what does holiness mean? Well, it means God doesn't want you to have any fun because he's such a prude, you know. <laughs> or it means God, you know, has a bunch of arbitrary lists of do's and don'ts just to see if you're going to do it right. That's not holiness. That's not what it means. Holiness means to be like God. It means, holiness means different. Why? Because he's different. There's no one like God. And, and he's unlike everyone else. He's good, and he wants us to be the same. That's, if you want to sum up what holiness, really practical holiness looks like, it's that. But we need to be taught, because where we came from did not demonstrate it to us. And where we're headed, and where we live, and where we look around, does not demonstrate holiness to us. It has to be given by him. And so if we're going to live a life that's different, we have to get it from him. Now, for Israel... In the Old Testament, them being different was, was to be done at this time by a bunch of defined laws and rules that they were given. And that's, that's what we're going to look at in the next few chapters. That, that God would give them a list of standards and ways to live that affected every area of their life to help to, to make them different than everyone else. And, and God wants to do the same for us. He wants, to, he wants to affect every area of our lives to make us pleasing to him. And, and they were told that if they lived and practiced these things, here's what they would do. Here's another meaning of holiness. They would distinguish themselves from uh, those who did not belong to God. And that's really the main purpose of all these laws. The main purpose of all these laws is to distinguish themselves. They did, the, the laws had additional added benefits in many cases. For example, we're going to read some dietary law stuff tonight. And the dietary laws uh, followed strictly have a lot of good health benefits. But the health benefit of the dietary law is secondary. That's not the main purpose. The main purpose is simply that they would be different, that they would be distinct, that they would be holy like their God is holy. And, and, and in being distinct, they would stand out among others. It, it really is worth skipping to the end, toward the end of the chapter to get this, the purpose here. So verse 45 says, For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God, you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law of the animals and the birds and every living creature that moves in the waters and of every creature that creeps on the earth to distinguish between unclean and the clean and between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that is not eaten. So there he tells us the purpose. The whole purpose of these is to be holy, to be distinct. And God's purpose to make his people distinct that purpose hasn't changed at all it's still his purpose to make people distinct and and he wants us to to be distinct from the world now he does it differently the way that he wants us to be distinct is different than it was in the old testament but the purpose remains the same and and it's important to know that the the way is different because there's a lot of christians today that think that it's still the same that that God's going to make us holy by a bunch of rules, that that's how he's going to do it. But, but Jesus gave a completely different way to make us distinct. And, and as New Testament believers, we're not made distinct anymore by following all the do's and don'ts. Jesus said we would stand out. One way he said that we would stand out tremendously from everyone else is that we would love one another, that we would love each other, that, that, here we are, we're a bunch of sinners. We're still not perfect. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 
five years or 50 years, we still got stuff and, and we still do things that are offensive and we still do things that are lame and we still do things that annoy each other and we still do, do things that aren't very nice. And yet, if we love each other, they'll, he said, you'll, they'll know. That's how you distinguish yourself. That you'll, they'll know you're my disciples with your, by your love for one another. Because that's not what the world does, right? What does the world do when somebody is mean or annoying or says something rude? Or you, what, what does the world do? Well, maybe get in a fight. Maybe retaliate. Maybe, you know, whatever. Maybe uh, write them off and say, I'm done with you. I'm not talking to you ever again. Whatever. But, he, but the Lord would have us distinguish ourselves from all of that by saying, here, you're my people. I want you to be holy. Here, do, be holy by loving each other. And not just by saying it, but, but by actually doing it, loving each other. Another way that the New Testament teaches us how to uh, distinguish ourselves, Peter wrote in his first epistle uh, that holiness comes by obedience. It says in uh, 1 Peter 1, uh, 1, 14 and 15, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you as is holy, you also shall be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So he says there, as obedient children. That's how, that's how holiness comes. Just, that's a simple way to distinguish yourself as a, whole, as a child of God, because the world is not doing that. The world is not being obedient to God. So we just distinguish ourselves. We're doing our best to say, I'm going to follow what God says. I'm going to do what he says. And so we stand out and distinguish ourselves as God's people when we love each other the way the Lord loves us and when we're obedient to Jesus as Lord of our lives. So holiness standards for Israel were, were uh, not quite there yet, but they did have them. And it starts out here with this dietary law. And again, since they were to distinguish themselves and be different. The main point here is that God is going to go, I'm going to give you a way to eat that is different than the way most other people in the whole world eat. Your diet and your methods of eating are going to be different. It's going to be distinct. It's going to be noticeably different. Now, why eating? How does diet do that? Well, again, number one, most people don't follow too many rules when they eat. And everybody eats all the time. I mean, think about how many times you eat, right? You eat at least a couple times a day, if not three, and you eat. So that's a lot. There's a lot going on there. And so here's a simple way to noticeably go, go wow, those people are different. And, and so it would be a huge way. Think, imagine it like this. So a, a, you're a Jewish person, and there's a, a Gentile with you, and, and a Jewish person says, uh, the Gentile offers him something. Nice piece of bacon-wrapped shrimp. <laughs> right? Okay. And the Jewish person says, oh, uh, we don't eat that. And the person says, you, you don't eat that? Why not? Man, Everyone loves bacon-wrapped shrimp. I got all kinds of extras. Why would? It's so good. And the, they would say, well, not us. Our God doesn't want us to. He wants us to be different. He doesn't want us to eat like everyone else. And so I want to honor him, and so I'm not going to eat it. Now, again, this is a Jewish law. We're not under this. We got this cleared up in the New Testament, so enjoy the bacon-wrapped shrimp. <laughs> but notice... Think about how that worked. I just gave a, a hypothetical situation that could be very real, right? Just having a conversation like that could lead to God. How? Every time they ate. Wait, how come you don't want the bacon-wrapped shrimp? How do you not like bacon-wrapped shrimp? Well, there are some people out there, but they're a whole different story. I won't mention any names. But most people would love that, and so that, but, but they, because they want to follow what God has told them, Every time they ate, there was an opportunity to first stand out as distinct. I'm not like everyone else. And the secondly, it leads to God because you go, well, why not? They say, why not? And, and, and then I'll tell you. Now, 
That's the opportunity that something like this gives. Unfortunately, for the Jews and for many Christians, the distinctness instead of an opportunity for a testimony and a witness becomes an opportunity to be a snob, to be spiritually arrogant. Ew, we don't eat that. You know, that's how it comes across. You eat that? That's disgusting. How ungodly, how terrible that you would eat that. Yeah, we don't eat that. And, and, and our standard of obedience to God in order to be distinct is never to make us be snobby looking down at people's are looking down our, our noses at people who don't have that standard you know and, and the same thing can happen to us as christians we can look down at people because they're doing stuff that we don't do or or we can even do it to other christians because they're not as serious and strict in their observance and so Sadly, many Christians become snobby about their distinctions, too. And here's the problem with that. That erases the distinction. How does it do that? Because everybody's snobby when they think they're better than someone else. So if you take this issue of distinction and go, I just, I don't do that. Why not? Well, I, I just, God doesn't want me to, and I want to honor him. That's fine. That's great. But if then you turn around and look at others, including other Christians, oh, you do that. Now you're just like everybody else. You're just like everybody else and you erase it. So it's important to keep the distinction and keep it unto God and remember that it honors him. It doesn't make you better. It, makes, it, bring, it brings glory to his name. So once again, uh, I'm going to read verse 1 and 2 again because that was kind of long. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth, among the animals which divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, you, that you may eat. So the first rule they get is that when it comes to land animals, you can eat any animal that has these two characteristics. First characteristic is it has to have a divided hoof. So it has to have a hoof, and the hoof has to be divided. So uh, the, the, it, there's a split in the hoof. So you can't have, it can't be a pod animal, and it, and it can't be a solid hoofed animal. So let, you can't eat a horse. They don't have split hoofs. So it has to have, that's the distinction. That's the way God uh, categorized them. And then the second uh, thing that it had to have was it had to chew the cud. Now, what does that mean? Well, in general, it, in general, very general, you could say it meant a very thorough type of uh, chewing process for digestion. The specifics would be they chew more than once. Most of the animals that chew the cud would, uh, uh, biblically speaking, would uh, regurgitate out of their mouth because they had some, most of them had more than one stomach. So they would regurgitate and then chew it again and regurgitate and then chew it again. And that was uh, the way that they did it. And, and uh, some of the animals even would regurgitate wouldn't be the proper word, and I'll just say it is well it would come out of a different orifice and then they would chew it again and so you know nobody said animals do pretty things so uh, in everything that they do but those were the basic rules for land animals that they could eat if both of those features were present in an animal they could do it verse 4 they could eat it nevertheless these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hoods, hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud, but it does not have cloven hooves, it is unclean to you. So this is making it clear because people need things to be made clear by God because otherwise we, we're really good at bending rules or coming up with you know, loopholes and things. It has to have both criteria, and he gives an example of one that doesn't have both criteria. Oh, does that mean we can eat 
we can eat camels? No, you can't eat camels. They, they only do one of those. They only chew the cud, but they don't have a split hoof. And, and so, um, and then he gives some more examples of forbidden animals. Verse 5, the rock, the rock hyrix, uh, the, another name for that would be the coney, which is like a big hamster, like a real big hamster. That's kind of what they look like. Bigger than your hamsters. Yeah. So they run. You can, when we went to Israel, we saw some of those. We'll see them if you're going to go. They're pretty crazy. You're just like, What's the, what just moved out there? There's a whole bunch of them. And then you look, and they sure enough, they look like big hamsters. Uh, um, so the rock hyrax, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, it is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcass you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. So we have some examples of forbidden animals. Um, so um, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Where did I lost my point? My, pran- bleh, my train of thought. Well, pigs, we already mentioned, you know, bacon-wrapped shrimp, but most people, if they know anything about kosher eating or Old Testament dietary law, most people know that, you know, they don't eat pigs, no ham, no bacon. You won't get any of that in your breakfast when you go to Israel. Um, uh, here's, one of the, here's one of the benefits of that. And again, the benefits are secondary to the, the, the purpose is distinction. Everybody eats bacon. Everybody eats ham. But one of the benefits here is that, uh, especially back then, uh, pork has potential for uh, a lot of disease. You really have to cook it well to eat it. So God didn't want them to eat it. Um, and, And then some of these animals and these unclean animals, not only were they forbidden to eat them, but if they were dead, they weren't allowed to touch them either. And so... Again, this is about being different, the health benefits there. But let's talk about those health ben- benefits for a minute. Most of the animals that are forbidden had, were uh, unclean in the sense of they, had, they were dirty. The, you know, pigs eat trash, and they're at, a lot of their eating habits would lead to disease. Um, and these animals were mostly unhealthy to you, uh, for you especially if not prepared the right way. There's not a lot of room for error in, in, in a lot of these animals. Um, and so God, rather than making a big old recipe book for them, he, he just decided to say, here's, here's what you eat, here's what you don't eat, and by the way, you'll be healthier if you follow this. And so he just commands it, and they're to trust him. When you think about the fact that these Rules are given for distinction and yet have the added benefit of health. It's pretty awesome to think about because it tells us that when God gives commands, they're never arbitrary. They're, he cares about the health and eating habits of people. He, God cares about what people eat. And and even though this was primarily about obedience, it it just reminds us that his ways are best in every area. And and one of the ways we could apply this, if we want to apply it in principle and not, uh, you know, in legalism, because, you know, as New Testament believers, like I said, we can eat we can eat these things. But if we want to follow it in principle, the principle here would be if God is interested in in his distinctions being a better thing for us then then he would want us still to be the kind of people that eat in a way that leads to good health why because he wants us to have strength and good health to serve him and to honor him and and so that will have energy and that will have vigor as long as we can, and that and it would testify of his goodness to his people. Just consider this. We're we're not legalistic, and so this is not any kind of rule. Just 
consider it like this. Imagine if Christians in general, and I don't think this is true, so I'm, that's why I say imagine. If Christians in general stood out as people who ate more healthy than everyone else. Imagine if among Christians there was very little or no gluttony. You know, we didn't pig out. Or we did, we, more than others, we avoided all the junk food, all the garbage that we tend to eat. Imagine that. Imagine if among Christians we ate the right amount. We didn't gorge ourselves. We, we had less obesity and things like that. Imagine if Christians didn't live to eat like so many do. Just live for that next meal. Where am I going to get that greatest meal? What should we? I don't know because I have to find the best possible meal. I have. We think that way all the time as Americans. So many of us do. We don't live for that, though. Instead, we live for, we eat to live. Imagine if we did that. You know what, what would happen? We wouldn't have perfect health. We wouldn't. There's still, we're still fallen, you know. There's still all kinds of other things that bring about poor health. But we would have better health. We certainly would if we did that. And, and uh and yet we don't. This isn't, we don't do this as a practice as Christians. And because we don't, so many Christians limit themselves to be able to have as much strength and health as they could have, as much as God would give them. And so they're limited. You know, they can't, they don't have the vigor and strength and energy that they need to be able to serve as much as they want. Imagine if we thought about the truth that. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we'll apply that to other areas of life. Well, I'm not going to smoke because I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to get drunk because God doesn't want me to get drunk. I don't want to drink because I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. We apply that, and that's good. We should. That's a good idea. But what if we took it further and said, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, and I want to honor God, and so as much as I can, I want to eat well and eat healthy, and, and I won't have perfect health, but it'll probably be better than it's been. And, and it, would, it would do what would the Israelites would have, and they'd go, why? Why? It'd, have, it'd be another conversation starter. It'd be another thing where people go, why? How come you guys don't eat bacon-wrapped shrimp? Well, because God doesn't want us to. How come you guys are always eating healthy and you don't go to all-you-can-eat buffets and get 10 servings? How come you don't do that? Well, because it would hinder my ability to serve God, and so I don't. And, and, and uh, anyway, this isn't legalism. We're, this is no rule. I'm not giving you a rule right here. Just something to think about, especially in light of this, you know, pig-out country that we live in. So... Uh, I, and trust me, I am preaching to myself first. I promise you that I am. Verse 9, these you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water, or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. They shall be an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abomination. Whatever in the water does not have fins or scales, that shall be an abomination to you. So here's seafood guidelines. It must have both fins and scales. This is their rule. And so that leaves out all the yummy shellfish. Crab, lobster, shrimp, calamari, uh, clams, mussels. My mouth's watering. Oysters. <laughs> also catfish because they don't have, uh, uh, they have fins but not scales. Um, there's probably others like that too. And they're so tasty. But health-wise, they're, they're bad for you. Like, the, uh, like catfish and other, they're like bottom feeders, so they eat all the garbage. And, uh, and then the uh, shellfish are full of cholesterol. But, um, and then some, some of those shellfish, like mussels 
and some of the other ones can only be harvested at certain times of the year. And if you pick them at the wrong time, they can actually either make you really sick or kill you because they have some sort of toxin. You'll see them out, out on the beach here. You'll see signs, you know, no muscle gathering during these months. And I don't know what those months are. I usually just get muscles at the restaurant. <laughs> I'm going to eat them. What's that? Okay, that's when you can have them? Okay, interesting, yeah. So God's like, let's just not even mess around with that for Israel. Just don't eat these things. There's a lot of yummy fish, a lot of yummy fish. I mean, uh, anyway. But again, he cares about their health. He cares about our health. Some of this stuff would help. If it's got tons of cholesterol in it, it'd help you avoid heart disease. Verse 13, And these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds, they shall not be eaten. They are an abomination, the eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, and the falcon after its kind. So when it says after its kind, it means in every species along that, those lines. So, you know, he's just going, I don't need to list out every kind. Any kind of, any kind like any of these, like any, any falcon, any and every falcon. Every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, and the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the fisher owl, and the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw, and the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron, after its kind, the hope, hoopoe, and the bat. So here's another category of uh, food, and it says birds in our translation, but in Hebrew, it's literally flying creatures, so if anybody wants to try to go, oh, the Bible doesn't know what it's talking about. It listed bats under birds, and everyone knows a bat's not a bird. It, not in English, it's not, but in Hebrew, the, it's a flying creature. And so um, just giving you that because there's so many little things uh, anti-Bible people like to nitpick, and they usually don't know what they're talking about. So they um, anyway, um, so these are a bunch of birds that are not to eat. A lot of these are carry-on, meaning they eat dead things. And so that makes them risky because there's a lot of uh, illness and sickness and bacteria and disease in those things. Notice in this list it says, they shall be an abomination to you. Meaning they should be, you should think of them as dirty and disgusting and hateful. And it says, they shall be an abomination to you. God isn't saying they're an abomination to me. There are many things God says are an abomination to him. He doesn't hate these birds. He just doesn't want them eating them. And he says, and I, I want you to, just to make it easy on yourself, begin to train yourself to think of them as, no, as just completely no. This is abs an absolute no for me. So what he's getting at is, don't, don't just long for them all the time and go, well, man, I would eat it, but God won't let me. He's like, he's like think of it like train yourself to just have a, a total and strong aversion to even thinking about eating them. And one of the ways, reasons why that would be helpful is because if you live in the world, inevitably you're going to come across, you're going to go to a restaurant, you're going to be traveling out of town, and they're going to go, oh, we have fresh seagull today. Ooh, that's that's gross. Some of these are just disgusting to even think about, but but because uh, you see what the seagulls eat, you know we hang out, we know what the seagulls eat, and it's like, Ugh. but but he says, you know that's how I I don't know I don't want you to just not eat them. I want you to not want to eat them. Do your best to not want to. Train your mind. Imagine if we did that. If we could train ourselves to think of the things that God forbids as not just. Oh, I wish I could, but he won't let me. But, ugh, ugh. Now, some of those things are easy to do that with. You know, we have no, no temptation to those types of things. But some of them we have, to, we have to, you know, focus on and ask God to, you know, train our thinking to make these things personally abhorrent to our thinking. And, and uh, if we could do that in more and more areas we do a lot better in staying separate from sin. But, um, so, you know, Lord, help us to hate the things you forbid. 
Verse 20, all flying insects that creep on all fours shall be an abomination to you. That sounds good. Yet these may, you may eat of every flying insect. Whoa, back up, slow down. Flying insects that creep on all fours, those which have jointed legs above their feet, which, with which to leap on the earth. These you may eat. The locust after its kind, the destroying locust, the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. But all other flying insects which have four feet shall be an abomination to you. So again, verse 20 starts out easy, no problem. Don't eat the flying bugs. Check, got it. I have mastered that one. But then in verse 21, we see there were some that they could actually eat. And, and the, the, the distinction was this. If it only flies, no. If it flies and hops, yes. So that's kind of the rule and uh, interesting. Now, these are allowed. These aren't required. You don't have to eat these bugs. So, you know, if you're a Jew, you don't have to go around having, you know, cricket salad or whatever. So, um, of course, the most famous example of, of the bug eater in the Bible is John the Baptist. And he, he had a sweet tooth, so he added a little honey to his locusts locusts and wild honey um so i guess can't, like i've seen these in places and i never knew if they were real or a joke but maybe you've seen them it's like a piece of clear hard candy with like a cricket inside i've seen those and i always look at them and go yeah no thank you um but if you want to be kosher you're allowed to eat that so verse 24 by these you shall become unclean. Whoever touches the carcass of any of them shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries part of the carcass of any of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. The carcass of any animal which divides the foot but is not cloven, hoofed, or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Everyone who touches it shall be unclean. And whatever goes on its paws among all animals, kinds of animals that go on all fours, those are unclean to you. So you can't eat uh, kitty cats and puppy dogs. Whoever touches any such carcass, and there are people that do that, whoever touches any such carcass shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries any such carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It is unclean to you. So he reiterates some of the rules, adds some more, you know, no dogs and cats. And then in addition to this, um, as it relates to them being dead, they're not only to not eat them, but they're not to touch them when they're dead. And then, and then he talks about it, it's making them unclean. And that's a big deal um, because the uncleanness here is not moral uncleanness. This doesn't create, violation of these things does, did not create a moral guilt. It was a ceremonial, ceremonial uncleanness, which meant they would be prohibited from touching any holy thing, any holy articles. It would, they'd be prohibited from going to, into the tabernacle or later on the temple. That's what the uncleanness meant. You can't participate in worship during the time that this makes you unclean. And, and it, was, it was not permanent. The ceremonial uncleanness was never permanent. There were some sins, and we read some of them earlier in, in previous chapters, and we'll read some more later, where the, the sin would cause the violator to be completely cut off from the nation. There were sins that bad. But these were uh, violations that were not moral violations, and so the penalty wasn't as steep, but it still had a penalty because uh, it still needed to communicate seriously what was communicated. And that was that God is holy and your relationship with him needs to always remember that. Always keep that in mind. This is a privilege that you get to have a relationship with God. And we want it to remain uh, something different than any other relationship. So this is the way they would do it. Verse 29. These also shall be unclean to you among the creeping things that creep on the earth the mole, the mouse, and the large lizard after its kind. So after its kind, meaning any large lizard. The gecko, the monitor lizard, the sand reptile, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. 
these are unclean to you among all that creep. Whoever touches them when they are dead shall be unclean until evening. Anything on which any of them falls when they are dead shall be unclean, whether it is any item of wood or clothing or skin or sack, whatever item it is in which any work is done, it must be put in water and it shall be unclean until evening. So I had to soak it. Then it shall be clean. Any earthen vessel into which any of them falls, you shall break and whatever it is, is in it shall be unclean. So the earthen vessel was more porous, so it could seep into it more. And so don't even bother cleaning that. Just get rid of it. Toss it. It's, it's done. Um, uh, in such a vessel, any edible food upon which water falls becomes unclean. And any drink that may be drunk from it becomes unclean. So this uncleanness transfers not only to the... Uh, the dish, but whatever food or drink was in the dish, and everything on, and that makes sense, right? Some people eat stuff off the floor, but, you know, most of us kind of frown upon that. I mean, there are three second rules for things that are real hard and not porous, and depending on where it falls, there's no three second rule if it, like, falls in a cow patty. I mean, there's no three second rule there, so, um, anyway. Uh, but for them, that God said, let's just, not, let's just not be the... Here's how you can distinguish yourself. It's kind of sad, right? But they could distinguish themselves by being, be the kind of people who never eat anything off the floor. Just do that. How about that? Good idea? Yeah, all right, good. <laughs> I, I didn't say I'm following that rule. It depends on what it is for me. I, I'm just kind of being honest. And, like if it falls on a, our... Uh, uh, whatever, we don't need to go. Yeah, yeah, okay. Verse 35, And everything on which a part of any such carcass falls shall be unclean, whether it is an oven, in an oven, or cooking stove, it shall be broken down, for they are unclean, and shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern in which there is plenty of water shall be clean, but whatever touches any such carcass becomes unclean. And if a part of any such carcass falls on anything, any planting seed which is to be sown, it remains clean. Why? Because it's going to go in the dirt, and that's not the part that's going to produce any food or anything. It says, but if water is put on the seed, or if any part of that such carcass falls on it, it shall become unclean to you. So at the point when it's got some sort of, if the, some, for some reason with the water added to it, and then it's unclean. And so... Um, the things listed at the beginning, the mole and the mouse and all that, those are all a bunch of more kind of gross animals anyway. They crawl around in nasty places. They eat nasty things. Um, but they're also not to even touch these things, which is interesting because that means um, a Jew can't have, a Jewish person can't have a, uh, like a snakeskin boot. Like if they want to go to the, the cowboy place and go dancing, they can't wear the snakeskin boots. So, because that would be a dead, you know, lizard or whatever. And so, um, and then he talks about the rules as, as if to, if something unclean touches a piece of clothing or a tool or a vessel or something for cooking, any one of those things, if it was porous would to be destroyed, if it was not, they had to clean it thoroughly, you know, soak it overnight, wash it. And, uh, and so all of these things were cleanliness standards that would make them distinguished there wasn't a lot of when this was written and still today in many places and in many ways people aren't super concerned about cleanliness and that's kind of one that we should like right hey if and you know i don't know where this saying came from cleanliness is next to godliness it's certainly not in the bible but in a sense maybe it just developed from this because god's the one that said hey i want my people to be clean don't be all dirty you're going to benefit from this. There's a lot of germs out there. And they didn't know anything about germs back then. And, and so anything that needed to be washed would be put into water. Um, and then there was in, within that part that we read that if, if the water was, uh, and it doesn't give a, an amount, but it basically just says if there's a lot of water, 
if the thing that you clean, if you have to clean something in a large amount of water, that water doesn't have to be tossed because it's diluted. And so, um, you know, he's, he's not trying to make it unreasonable. He's just trying to make it as, uh, as needful as it can be. Verse 39, and if any animal uh, which you may eat dies, he who touches its carcass shall be unclean until evening. He who eats of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. He also who carries its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. So even clean animals that die, uh, meaning they die naturally or killed, other than being butchered or prepared for sacrifice, the clean animal that dies in those ways is also considered to be unclean, so they weren't to touch those either. Verse 41, And every creeping thing that creeps on the earth shall be an, an abomination. It shall not be eaten. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever goes on all fours, or whatever has many feet, among all creeping things that creep on the earth, so you, like centipedes, I guess, these shall you shall not eat, for they are an abomination. You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy." Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, for I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall be whole, therefore be holy, for I am holy. And so um, we, we looked at that at the beginning, uh, the purpose here for all these, for to be distinct, to be different, to not be like everybody else. Verse 46, this is the law of the animals and the birds and every living creature that moves on in the waters and of every creature that creeps on the earth to distinguish between the unclean and the clean and between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may not be eaten. And so something else uh, when you think about this is, you know, they didn't have the FDA back then. Uh, they didn't have... This way back then, they didn't have, you know, uh, food. This was their food standards. In a sense, God was their FDA. And, uh, and, and, and the thing is, is he came through for them better than any FDA ever could because God knows way more about cleanliness than the FDA ever does. And they didn't know about all these things. We know a lot today, but we still don't know everything. We, they didn't know about salmonella and E. coli and all these things and parasites, you know, certain animals you really risk parasites if you don't cook really well. And so he's given them that. And, and the, the Jewish people, generally speaking, throughout history have greatly benefited from this. There's been times in, in the history where plagues uh, swept in different areas, plagues in Europe, and lots of people were getting sick and dying. And um, I think it was the bubonic plague I read that they're, they're, uh, most of the Jewish community stayed pretty darn healthy because they kept such strict rules of cleanliness. And then, of course, because of that, they get persecuted because, hey, how come your people aren't getting sick and ours are? And what did you do to us? And, you know, and that whole thing. And, uh, but God did it. Every law that God gives... Uh, that he gave to his people then, or he gives it to us now, it's always for our good, one way or the other. It's, all, it's always spiritually good to obey, first of, all, first of all. But there's always there's always some other benefit in it, too. He loves us, and he wants to, you know, he wants to do us good. And, and so, uh, anyway, verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days, as in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. So here's a ceremonial law regarding childbirth. And again, not moral law. This isn't, you know, you're morally 
clean. Um, but when a woman gave birth to a child, then she would be unclean for a period of time, meaning, again, she couldn't participate in, in the worship at the tabernacle or, or in the temple later while unclean. And, and during that period of time, anything that she would touch would be made unclean as well. Um, the child is not unclean here. The, it's it's the, uh, the, the mother who gave birth. Now, why? Why would she be considered unclean for worship? Um, well, uh, the, we're going to go on and read other stuff in the law, too, about this. And it has to do with bod- a lot of, uh, there's a lot to say about bodily fluids. And bodily fluids, we know now, whether they knew this or not, we know now that many uh, bodily fluids can carry bacteria, can carry viruses, can carry disease, and um, it's not, and here you have a woman, women take a while to heal after having a baby, you know, it takes some time, and uh, they needed, they, they needed to be, just to be abundantly safe, and especially from bringing any illness into the place of worship, they needed to not be interacting that way. It, it wasn't safe, it wasn't healthy. And so uh, to protect the people, to protect the place of worship, to protect the woman herself, because she needs some time to heal too, there would be a period of time where she was uh, to just lay low, hang out, and uh, be careful not to spread anything. And so for the time she would be unclean, that's what would happen. Now, as it relates to a baby boy, the first part of that uncleanness was for the first seven days. And then uh, verse 3 says, On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be, un- shall be circumcised. She shall then continue in the blood of her purification 33 days. She shall not touch any hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are fulfilled. So after that seven-day period, uh, the law required babies to be, uh, baby boys to be circumcised. That was how they kept uh, the Abrahamic covenant. And that was established long before this, but now it's made clear that this is definitely included in the Mosaic law. And uh, and so that's what they were to do. And... uh, it, may, it says that here to make it clear that the, the woman's uh, time of uncleanness after childbirth doesn't interrupt that. You still need, they still need to do that. And so um, that first seven days is the initial uncleanness where she's not supposed to touch anything or, or anyone. After this, she has another 33 days where she uh, has to stay away from the place of worship, but she doesn't have to be all, you know, no touchy to people at home and that kind of thing. And and her husband. And so the total amount for here was for when, when a woman had a baby boy, 40 days. Verse 5, but if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, not just seven days, but two weeks, as in her customary impurity. And, and I didn't mention that before, but that's uh, this uncleanness applied to uh, the, when a woman's uh, menstrual cycle as well. So she would be unclean during that period as well. And, uh, and then she shall continue in the blood of her purification 66 days. So a female child required a longer time to be purified, twice as long as for having a baby boy. And so the total here comes to 80 days. And that probably, there's probably nobody in our culture that reads that and goes, you know, and it seems odd and, and that kind of thing. And it, and it doesn't say why here in the text. And, and so we're not given a clear reason. There's plenty of speculation, all kinds of speculation, uh, but it doesn't say here. So, you know, we're st- you can stick with speculation if you're comfortable with that. 
but uh, you know, uh, it's, as it says in uh, First or Second Corinthians, it says don't go beyond what's written. So you, you it's fine speculating, but don't try to make it into the into the Word of God. A um, couple of decent reasons of speculation, and again, complete guesses, is um, you know maybe because and this none of them are, are perfect. So maybe because the woman giving birth to a, another girl means she's going to be a woman and she's going to perpetuate bringing life to more sinners. What I don't know. Another one is. Maybe it looks back to Eve, who was the first one to sin. Um, I don't know. If you like either one of those, okay. But it's not in the Bible, so that's what we have. Uh, But here's what we do know. This is what we do know. In no way did it mean that having a baby girl was worse or that women are worse. And we we can be 100% certain of that because of the next part. Verse 6 says, when the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether it be with a boy or a girl, it says whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her, and she shall be clean from the flow of her blood this is the law for her who was, has born a male or a female. So once that period of time was done, in order to enter back into you know, regular worship, a burnt offering and a, a sin offering were to be offered, and it was the same whether for a boy or a girl. So if there was any kind of, you know, anyone thinking that, oh, you know, girls aren't as good as boys or whatever, Nonsense. They, the same offering was given here. Um, so again, we don't know w- why the longer period. Um, you could probably go online if you're really curious and read all the different uh, th- theories on that. But, but uh, the fact was that as part of the ritual, in order for her to enter back into the regular, I'm, I'm not unclean, I'm clean, now I'm right for worship, is they were to bring uh, this offering. Um, uh, Verse 8, and if she is not able to bring a lamb, meaning she can't afford to, then she may bring two turtle doves. or two. So it was a lamb and a turtle dove or a pigeon, but if you couldn't bring a lamb, then just bring two turtle doves or two pigeons. One is a burnt offering and the other as a sin offering. And so the priest shall make atonement for her and she will be clean. And so here... God, we've seen this earlier when we were reading through the sacrifices and the offerings, but we see God's desire to make atonement uh, attainable for everyone, even for poor people. And if they couldn't afford a lamb, he said, okay, um, you, you'll bring a, a turtle dove. And, and we talked about this when we were talking about these different offerings that it's never going to be free. Because what needed to be communicated in the offerings is these sacrifices cost, cost something. And they needed to always have that in their mind. So it's never going to be free. But it was never going to be out of reach either. And, uh, and so God provided that. And what's really cool about that is that in Luke's gospel, um, when Mary went through this process after Jesus was born, we're told that they brought the, the two doves which tells us we know in other ways too, but we know for certain that Jesus was born into a poor family. And so strike 10,592 for the, you know, uh, uh, what's that called? The, um, the, pe- the prosperity gospel, yeah. right? I mean, come on. It's just such nonsense if people would just read their Bibles. God wants you to be wealthy. He didn't want his own son to be in a wealthy family, but he wants you to be wealthy. I mean, come on. So, but it just reminds us that God, uh, how God sees the poor, he definitely doesn't see them in a lesser way. When God said, who am I going to use to raise my son as an infant? He found a poor couple. And he, and, he, and he used them. 
and and so and God blesses them. All right, we'll stop there. Father, we thank you once again for your word. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you care about us in every area of our lives. You have something to say even about the way we eat. And we're not under these laws at all. Um, we, you've made everything clean as, for us as New Testament believers. But you do still care about cleanliness and how we eat and all these things. So, uh, Lord, help us to honor you even in that. Help us to honor you even in these ways. Uh, not as uh, legalists, but as just people that are aware that there's a way to be pleasing to you in every area of our lives, and we want to know what it is, and we want to do it. So thank you, Lord, and we pray it in Jesus' name.